I'm going to introduce each commentator briefly, and they're going to make brief comments. First is Kim Hill. Kim is an old buddy from the University of Michigan, where we all got imbued with the Bill Hamilton juice. Um, and he decided many years ago to come to the Southwest, and I thought he was, I'm not sure what word to say, he, he wasn't courageous enough to stay in the North. But now I know he was just sensible. Um, he's been here at ASU for a number of years, one of the world's leading biological anthropologists, studying the Aceh and other cultures with enormous detailed data instead of just opinion. And we're glad to have you here, Kim. What do you make of all this? Yeah, I just want to mention, not only do Randy and I go way back, but Mel and Sarah had a huge impact on my career when I Hold was your right up there, please. junior faculty. Can you hear him okay? was influenced heavily by both of their work and writings. Um, so I came out of three months of field work and I was given five days to try to read this book and uh, react. I wanted to react to the actual book rather than uh, summaries and so on. Uh, I was a little taken aback at first by what seemed like a, a bit of hyperbole uh, not that women are equal to men, but that are women superior to men. The title, and I, oh, geez, that's that that book might be a little strange. I might be bothered by that. Um, actually, the book doesn't seem like it's really too much going in that direction. It does point out big differences that we know are real, biological differences that affect all kinds of things: physical, uh, morphological, physiological, behavioral, cognitive, emotional, and so on. Uh, the bottom line, of course, is that women, in fact, are superior to men in some realms, in many realms, and that men are better than women in some ways. But ultimately, in a sexually reproducing species, both sexes kind of, by biological criteria, have to be equal. Um, I think that my reaction is that, yeah, actually, the big picture after reading most of the book was, yeah, I kind of agree with most of the book. Um, the big trend that uh, things were slightly different a long time ago, and then there's been a long period of um, alliance-based coercive control of females in uh, ways that by modern standards of the kinds of uh, social systems we would like to construct look pretty ugly. And then things seem to be changing. It kind of reminded me of Steve Pinker's book when Pinker first contacted me and said, the basic thrust of my book is going to be this, that violence has been, uh, was much worse for a long time and is now getting better. I'm like, yeah, that jives with everything I know from the remote tribes I've worked with and the world history and so on. So um, I don't have much to quibble with. There are details I could quibble with, but the big picture, I, I pretty much am on board with uh, everything Mel says here. He gives a good summary of sex differences. They are real and important. Uh, there are things that women are better at. There are things that men are better at. The bottom line is that you, you can't put that all together and proclaim either sex to be superior to the other. Although it is true that if the goal is to construct societies um, perhaps uh, where the common good is the single most important criteria, natural selection hasn't always designed brains to um, prioritize the common good. and some of the female proclivities seem to be better in that direction than male proclivities. Um, I was shocked. I, I thought I would pull out some ammunition against this. You know, I, I do buy that males are much more violent. They're much more involved in sexual aggression. I wasn't so sure I buy that uh, the world would, the world political system would be less corrupt if women are in control. Uh, some of these female leaders he showed are being investigated for massive corruption right now. I've seen plenty of female corruption, but I was interested in other things like cooperation and rule breaking and social norms. And I quickly looked up on the internet this morning um, something that I thought was interesting. Are, are women more cooperative? Or, and my definition of that was, uh, do they give more to charitable giving and causes than males? We know they give more time, but you could argue, well, that's opportunity cost. They have more free time, so they participate. Turns out they give a hell of a lot more money, too. So yes, there, even for me, there were some surprises. Uh, women appear to be much more cooperative in terms of uh, uh, economic equality and so on. 
think maybe my time is Thank up. Thank you, Chairman. So Thank I'll you leave it there. for just a couple of minutes, too. Well done. I, he'll have more strong opinions <laughs> opposing something in a minute because I know. <laughs> Next, Sally Kitch is the founding director of the Institute for Humanities Research here and the Regents Professor for Women's and, Generals and Gender Studies. Uh, she came from a school somewhat south of the University of Michigan, but we can be friends now that we're both here. So. Yes, I spent years calling Michigan that school up north. Yes. So, uh, Well, thank you for inviting me. I know that uh, in some ways I'm the outlier in this group. Um, that is, I'm a humanities scholar, and I'm also a women and gender studies scholar. So I, And I look at things through an interdisciplinary lens. I also have a PhD from Emory, so we have that. We have that connection, too. <laughs> um, so I found a lot to enjoy about your book. Um, I opened it with trepidation, because it's never been my goal as a scholar um, to prove women's superiority in any way. Um, I'm open to that idea, though, I discovered. <laughs> So, and I'd read uh, Professor Hurdy's work and um, Ashley Montague and had that sort of background. And I thought, okay, let's see what somebody in this, at this time will do with this. And uh, I found myself cheering uh, for much of what you uh, talk about in the book. And uh, as I talked about it with other people, because I carried it around, I read it not in five days, but in 20 days in 20-page increments. Uh, so I carried it around when I had to wait somewhere. People asked me about it, and I said, well, this is his argument. And they'd say, wow, yeah, that's great. I, I like that. So I could see that there was a certain energy coming from this. Um, but there was one phrase uh, early in the book where you said, genes matter uh, a lot, uh, but, his, but um, let's see, you said, um, experience, learning, culture, and environment also matter a lot. We all accept that. But I actually thought this, that this is the crux of the question. How do we actually get precise about the interaction between experience and culture and the environmental biology that you discuss. And I found myself wanting more precision about that. And I found myself thinking um, that you were coming from a place of, that was trying to do both species thinking that is thinking about human beings in the, in the aggregate, and anthropological or cultural thinking, uh, and I sort of do cultural historical thinking myself, and there's a lot of specificity and there's a lot of variation among human beings if you look from the cultural historical perspective. And I wanted to know more about how those things really intersect with each other, whether the story you were telling was about culture and history overcoming genetic propensities, or if it was a story about the genes winning out in the end in certain ways, or what was the interaction between those. And even, I have to say, I, um, when it came to your, your lovely, positive, optimistic perspective about women's uh, progress, I'm, all, I'm more skeptical about some of that progress. And what, and what I wanted to know more about is how that progress interacts with the genetic and evolutionary um, material that you've unearthed, and which I found quite fascinating. So, even with progress, and, and as Kim was pointing out, just having a woman in charge does not bring nirvana. Um, we learned this long time ago. I could name names. Uh, Margaret Thatcher was a big lesson for me. But 
there are others who come along and they aren't exactly uh, live, taking us to the land of milk and honey. I, I just watched Iron Lady, I don't know if any of you have seen that movie, where uh, she's pounding on the table and saying she's sick of all these slackers that depend on the government and we're going to make them pay as much taxes as the rich people. I thought, oh, that's not communally oriented behavior. <laughs> so I think the, the complexity for me was how can we get more precise about this interaction? Um, and so a question to you is how do you see that and how could we do it? Then my final question for now, although I could go on, um, I have to ask you why the only feminist you cite in your book, only feminist scholar you cite, is Camille Paglia, whose book I actually don't think supports your perspective, even though you see a lot of connections. But I would love to introduce you to some other feminist writers um, who I think really are closer to doing what you are trying to do. Susan Bordeaux, Donna Haraway, uh, Elizabeth Gross. Elizabeth Gross in particular has done rereadings of Darwin uh, from what is now being called a feminist materialist perspective that brings nature and culture together in different ways. So um, I'd love to have a conversation with you uh, about more of that. But thank you for your courageous book and uh, it's really very provocative, and I enjoyed it a lot. So our next commentator is Sarah Hurdy, a dear friend for many years, who is a primatologist trained at Harvard. Uh, her book on the language, you saw the cover of it, but you didn't really hear about the impact of it and the struggle she had with everyone telling her, no, there can't be anything evolutionary <laughs> or biological about it. And she had to fight for years for people to respect the facts, and she's still trying to help us all understand this She's, her, her turn has gone towards Mothers and Others, a whole series of books about women and how women cooperate especially. Uh, I really recommend those highly to you. So now we're going to hear what she thinks about my book. Yeah. Um, I was really glad that Mel started where he did, reminding you of the first sentence of his book and the simple argument because there's just something about us today. We have trouble reading. And a lot of the criticisms of Mel's book have come from people who just kind of miss the nuances and the caveats. And he reminded us, he's saying, yes, there are some respects, respects having to do with being more prone to pro-social impulses, which Kim reminded us of with their charitable giving, that make women uh, better adapted to the peculiar conditions of the 21st century, where violence and capacities for violence are going to be less valued or less useful to society in general. They may continue to be important, unfortunately, in some areas of the world, but nevertheless, he's reminding us he's talking about some qualities. He's not talking about one sex being superior to the other, which is not a very interesting point to make, as, as Kim was, was saying. Um, but he's also providing, if you're reading closely, a very important message. And you know, it's just not quite accurate to say, as the great French feminist philosopher Simone de Beauvoir said years ago, the problem of women has always been a problem of men. No, the real problem is the one Mel alluded to today with his picture of the giant, cask-wearing, bewaddled, blue-necked cassowary. The problem is sexual selection, competition between one sex for access to the other sex, something Ed Wilson once referred to as the most antisocial force in evolution. And so you have... In our species, a very long tradition because of greater variance in male reproductive success than in female variance in reproductive success of sexual selection. It could easily have been different 
In marmosets, for example, little South American monkeys, the variance in female reproductive success is greater. And females are a lot more violent than males in marmoset monkeys. They're, they're much more prone to infanticide. They, they, they kill other females as infants. Sometimes their own daughters' infants. This is the grandmothers from hell in marmosets. And, and so it's sexual selection that we need to be thinking about. And this has led me to think a little bit more about some of the correctives we might suggest for a better world. Because Kim's point, of course, is, is very well taken, that just because you have female leaders, it doesn't mean they're going to make nice. They could, they could be corrupt. And in fact, female leaders might be particularly hard on female competitors and the offspring of their female competitors, like the mother of Mulo Ismail the Bloodthirsty, who has the reputation for the highest reproductive success of any male. His mother used to boil other women in oil, you know, so not, not such a good lady. Um, well, what are just the quick practical suggestions, just to, you know, as, as, a, as a mother and a housewife, I can be practical. Uh, we want to reduce sexual selection via monogamy. As the great geneticist William Rice showed years ago, you can, um, do I have time for a story about fruit flies? No, all right. Uh, you, <laughs> you can wipe out toxic traits in males in just 44 generations of monogamy, imposed monogamy, but ask me about it later. Um, you can have increased male investment of infants. Um, but I do think, I do agree with Mel's point that on the whole, having more women leaders, perhaps especially postmenopausal women leaders, perhaps especially grandmothers whose grandchildren have been spread all over the planet and they don't know where in charge, <laughs> um, that would be good. Um, but just to end this, that wonderful meeting that Mel imagined between Christine Lagarde, Angela Merkel, and Janet Yellen, that in fact did happen just about the time the book came out. In that meeting, Christine Lagarde was talking about the subprime mortgage crisis and how it had just taken the whole world into recession. All kinds of human futures and well-being were destroyed. Christine Lagarde says, yes, and what if it had been Lehman Sisters instead of Lehman Brothers? <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. Our final panelist is Melissa Wilson Sayers. Melissa is an evolutionary geneticist, and she actually studies sex chromosome evolution in particular and in specifics. And I think you're going to see quite remarkable discoveries from her in the next few years. She's a very valued member of our Center for Evolution and Medicine, and she'll have interesting things to say about this book. So I'm glad we're keeping expectations low. <laughs> um, no, with that, so I... I'm a geneticist. I do genomics and computational biology. And for me, getting a perspective, uh, anthropological and historical perspective, was really valuable in Mel's book. That said, so what I study are sex differences. I study the X and the Y chromosome and how the X and the Y, in the common ancestor of most mammals, two, uh, approximately 200 million years ago, were indistinguishable from each other. And so in the common ancestor of mammals, sex was not determined using sex chromosomes. Um, it was determined in a different way, probably via temperature or some other environmental component. And over the last 200 million years, we have evolved genetic sex determination and more specifically chromosomal sex determination. And so for me, the, maybe the, the point that's most important is to try to distinguish between sex and gender because Biological sex um, refers to the gametes that are produced, individuals that produce sperm or indib individuals that produce eggs, and the sex chromosomes help in determining that pathway, um, but they aren't just binary, right? So the, the New York Times editorial that you referred to talks a lot about um, variation across populations, and just like there's variations in gender identity, we also have a spectrum of variations in sex determination. Um, so the most interesting thing to me about studying sex chromosomes is, is maybe that we call them sex chromosomes at all. There's no other chromosome. There's no other chromosome anywhere that we call by its function. 
right? We don't have the Down syndrome chromosome. We don't have the cystic fibrosis chromosome. Why do we have a sex chromosome? And it turns out that it was a long-standing debate um, when chromosomes were first discovered and when this accessory chromosome, because the chromosomes don't look similar to each other, were first discovered. So the X was discovered first, the Y came later because of its size difference and also unique inheritance in the species that we chose. Um, and so for me, I'm, I'm particularly interested in how did you go from two chromosomes that look the same to chromosomes that are so different. The X has 1,100 genes on it. The Y has only 27 unique genes. How did we get there? What are the consequences? What does it mean for biological sex differences? And that's distinct from gender identity. Um, and we don't understand completely how the two interact. Um, and maybe the last thing just to keep in mind is that how common intersex is when we think about chromosomes. So speaking of individuals with X chromosome deficiency, um, and by this I mean actually individuals who just have a single X chromosome and no other sex chromosome, so Turner syndrome. These are individuals who are assigned female at birth, but they have one X chromosome. This occurs in one out of 25 live female births. Kleinfelter syndrome, which is individuals who have two X chromosomes and a Y chromosome and are assigned male at birth, occurs in one out of 500 to one out of 1,000 live male births. So when I think about the 70,000 students we have here at ASU, there's tremendous variation just in chromosomal diversity. Intersex individuals is as common as one in 100 individuals. Um, and so I think there's a lot of complexity. And when I think about the topic, sometimes I shudder at having forcing it into the binary of male and female because of all the variation that exists there. Thank you, Melissa, and all our panelists. Mel. <laughs> so next we're going to let Mel ask a question or two. He might want to try to respond to all of them, but I'm not going to let him. Um, we'll let him ask a question or two or make a brief statement prior to the panelists having a discussion amongst themselves, at which point we'll open it up to everyone. What do you make? So, first of all, I'm, I'm so honored by these I talk very, loud very so talented, well. very experienced scholars um, coming, first reading my book and coming here to, to comment. I'm afraid that some people out here are gonna, gonna think that you and I conspired to pick a talent panel that would no, they so haven't finished softballs. What, they, no, they haven't finished what uh, they're going but, to say. Uh, no, they have, okay. So um, let me just start with with what Kim said. I, I, it means a lot to me that you agree with most of what, what I said. <clears throat> uh, I think your first reaction that it seemed hyperbolic was, was right. It, it's deliberately hyperbolic uh, and meant to be very provocative, um, as in the X chromosome deficiency syndrome and so on. Um, but it, is, it also has 70 pages of references to uh, scholarly and scientific articles, mostly published in the 21st century, and it's, so it's, it's, it's a serious argument. Um, <clears throat> I want to, I'm, I'm going to leave Sally for last because uh, in some ways, it's, well, it's the most different from She's the most different from me in outlook, I think, although less so than I, I had predicted. Um, I was really scared of this whole thing. Oh, uh, you know, I was I was scared of it, all all of you, but especially of Sally. Um, the uh, Sarah's observation about the grandma from hell leads me to to observe that um, it is not true, and I don't say in the book that. Uh, women are entirely nonviolent and cooperative, uh, and that's a ridiculous idea. Sarah, Sarah's entire career establishes the the, the violent tendencies of, of females, and as Kim uh, emphasized, and I pointed out myself, we have uh, women leaders who have been very corrupt and have and been bad actors. I, I am talking about a statistical difference. I am talking about a uh, an outcome, I'm predicting an outcome that might be better statistically because of fundamental differences between males and females in certain of these traits. 
when you have parity in the world, uh, or even um, uh, if if women blow through that 50% marker on certain uh, in certain professions and, and roles, uh, will not eliminate corruption. It will not eliminate violence, even if only women are in control. But I am firmly predicting that it will be a, a, a significant improvement because of the differences between sexes. Um, <clears throat> Melissa's uh, point about about why we have a sex chromosome. I, I also, I, my, my approach to the sex and gender in the classroom is, is to use sex differences to describe the, the biological part and gender differences to describe mostly the, the psychological part. Um, and I think the reason that we, we call it a sex chromosome uh, is that we're really interested in sex and sex differences, even biologists. But, but, um, but certainly, uh, Melissa, I know from our conversation this morning, is making great contributions to our understanding of the evolution of, uh, of sex chromosomes. And, and um, I admire her work greatly. Um, so Sally's questions are, I think, are, are the most challenging. Um, how to get precise about, about genes and, and environment and their respective contributions is, is a question that I've been obsessed with forever. Um, my wife, Anne, is a developmental psychologist, very smart, spends her life doing interventions to change the environment to make children's lives better, including uh, young, young girls, uh, 10, 11 years old, who are at risk for commercial sexual exploitation. And she is intervening to, to, to make their lives better through changing the environment, and that um, unfortunately is not changing the genes of the perpetrators, uh, or, or for that matter, their environments. But it, but it is it is where we usually get our purchase, and that's very important. I think that for every, I, I tell students that that you know, as a very rough estimate, I I, I think of. 50-50 as a reasonable breakdown. And the, reason I, the other reason I mentioned Anne was that she hates that question and she refuses to address it. And she says it's all genes and all environment. And she's, she, she accepts a lot of genetic influences, but she won't parse that, that um, uh, respect the respective influences. I think it's a legitimate question. And, and my answer to it is that it depends a lot on the circumstances. You, if you look at at twin studies, if you give me uh, identical twins, 100 sets of identical twins, and give half of them piano lessons, uh, get one, half of each pair, one in each pair, piano lessons, you will get a result that shows you that piano uh, playing ability is 100% environmental and 0% genetic. And it, it is, in the way it's distributed in the general population is, a, I would say, Substantially more than half experiential you know, for that trait and very little genetic uh, for other traits. Well, let's take language, for instance. The differences uh, in vocabulary among the languages of the world, the 7,000 or so we know have existed, are entirely environmentally caused. But there are certain fundamental features, psychological features of language that we know are universal for human languages and universal, probably universals of, of the human brain. So it, every, for every trait, you have to be very careful. If you want to get, get into the details, you have to be careful for, and, say, and do it separately for every uh, human, human endeavor and characteristic. I would say about, about gender identity, gender identity is not very malleable. And actually, what Friedman, the psychiatrist, said, gender behavior is not very malleable. Um, it's it's much more malleable than than some people thought. Um, if you look at an, at, at a prison, uh, you get a lot of of same sex uh, sexual activity, uh, and for the majority of people uh, who are released from that prison, they won't be continuing that kind of activity on the outside. That is that is a circumstantial determination of of same sex behavior. But it's not the same as gender identity. It's not the same as what what happens to the five or ten percent or whatever it is of our of our population that that is really um, 
uh, attracted to uh, uh, sexually and romantically to members of their own sex or to both sexes, uh, probably a larger percentage. Those, those uh, committed identities in the general population <coughs> are, 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 in my opinion, largely uh, determined by biology, uh, uh, not, not just genes, but biology. So, uh, and as we progress, I think the goal is to, uh, that, that we should get more and more control of, of interventions that, that enable us to triumph over, over genes that, that have influences that we don't like. One of those things, in my opinion, is to, to, to bring, to, to sort of imitate the bonobos to the extent of bringing women into, into positions of influence <coughs> alongside men, but also uh, enabling women to have coalitions where they, they compare notes with each other and where, where they figure out, like Elizabeth Cady Stanton said, to, to how to keep uh, some male, certain male tendencies in line. Um, it's not quite true that the only feminists I refer to is Khalil Polly, uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton is <laughs> my favorite one because she's a, a, a different feminist. Uh, another is the Beauvoir, who I quoted on uh, uh, the same quote that Sarah mentioned, and another is Joan Roughgarden, a biologist uh, at Stanford who, who uh, writes about um, these same issues in a, in a quite different way. She doesn't accept Darwinian uh, sexual selection theory. Uh, she does accept the biological determination of, of, of gender, and she certainly is a feminist as well as a, a transgender woman uh, herself. Um, so those are my, my observations about your very, very uh, wise and, and uh, excellent questions. Are there any questions you'd like to address other members of the panel? Uh, ask them before we turn it open to a larger audience. So, um, I guess uh, I'd like to ask Sally, uh, Sally about um, more about the feminist theorists that you mentioned. I, I, I could only do so much in the book. I, I do think I should have done better with that. I, I you know, as I, I read them in, uh, in my limited way in that sphere, I see them doing very, very impressive analyses of how male oppression works and how it held women back. And I, I so t t tell me how you think some of, some of the, or tell me, tell me about what difference feminism means to you. I have, I have this idea that that, uh, that Elizabeth Cady Stanton is a was an essentialist. Uh, I don't know that for sure, but and she certainly didn't know anything about genes and biology. But good hormones. Um, but I wonder if there's a domain of of mo modern feminist thinking that like you seem to do, acknowledges up front that there are certain differences between male and female behavior that are not just purely cultural. Uh, yes, I mean, I can talk about this if there's time, but maybe you and I should talk afterwards. But I just want to say that um, there's been, the, as you rightly say in the book, there's been a long period where uh, feminist scholars have been resistant to the idea that these differences are hardwired into males and females. Um, that there's a lot of evidence, I think, that enculturation has a great deal to do with the way people turn out, the way groups turn out, the differences among groups across history and around the world. Um, but that resistance is changing. And one of the things that's making it change, um, in addition to the kind of work that you do, uh, is the environmental crisis uh, and the recognition that human beings are not separate from nature and that if we don't start thinking of ourselves as embedded in nature and as part of nature and as natural creatures, uh, not superior to nature and not in control because our attempts to control have turned out to be 
uh, not very smart, um, that, that we might be able to save our species. So there's uh, an understanding among these, these thinkers that if we're going to accept that we're part of nature, then we also have to look at some of the things that have been not looked at before. So that's sort of the basis, one of the bases uh, for it. Some of the women that I'm, ta or the theorists I'm talking about do come out of the sciences, so they're coming from the perspectives that you and Sarah and, um, are, are representing here. But some of them are coming from more cultural theory where they're beginning to see this, this sea change in the way human beings need to conceptualize themselves. And the idea about sex and gender being different is another challenging one because there's been a lot of theory that says they're not different. Um, that actually the, uh, what we used to call the social gender versus the biological gender are hugely intertwined for some of the reasons you were just describing. You can change circumstances and change people's sexual behavior uh, under those circumstances. I was thinking about prisons and all-girls schools, and there are all kinds of examples where studies have been done about this. Um, so there's, uh, there's some question about what's biological and what's cultural, and those questions are still around. Uh, and these, these feminist materialists, in particular, are responding a lot to the environmental situation and the, and the view of nature as separate from the human. Thank you, Sally and Mel. At this point, I think we're going to open it up to your questions. We have a couple of people with microphones ready to find you. And we'll see who gives the first question here. Please. Actually, who has the microphones? And can you find them, Lenore? Uh, thank you for your fascinating uh, discussion. Thank you for doing the book. Uh, my question is... Can we just ask people to identify themselves since we're part of the community? My name is Bob McCormick. I'm just a member of the community. Um, my question is, what are the possibilities, or, or, or what do you see as the uh, prognosis for a possible regression in, in the progress of women? I mean, we, it's a very confusing environment now where there are forces moving in many different directions. And do you, you've portrayed, at least here, a somewhat optimistic view for further progression of women. But is there a chance for regression? And if so, what could we do to make sure that that does not happen? So I'm gonna ask each member of the panel to give a very brief answer to that so we kind of mix it up a little bit. You can go first though, Mel. Yes, I think that's a wonderful question. And <laughs> Um, I, I, uh, I, as Yogi Berra said, uh, it's very difficult to make predictions, especially about the future. But I, I ignored that that warning mostly today. And uh, earlier today, I, or just before I came over here, I was I was talking with a young uh, reporter, um, Steve Hernandez, who, who, uh, um, well, I, I got into the subject of what of what happened during and after World War II. So during World War II, we had Rosie the Riveter, uh, and and uh, you know, men men all in, in 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 the war and women taking over men's jobs across the board uh, throughout the United States, including manufacturing and heavy duty uh, jobs. And the uh, you know the war ends and. <laughs> And all those women are expected to go back home, and they do. And the men go take their jobs that they've proven that they can do. Right. And uh, and and by the way, that's the big thing. The the big thing about people, including Margaret Thatcher and Angela Merkel, with politics I don't share. That all these women that have done this stuff have proven uh, that for thousands of years men have made the wrong prediction about what would happen. Which is they wouldn't be able to do it at all because they'd be too sensitive or too cyclical or too emotional or some some something like that. And it and they've been proven. Uh, you know, uh, us men have, have been proven wrong on that already. So yes, it happened after World War II. We got the classic Gazi and Harriet family of, 
of the of the fifties, uh, uh, somehow out of Rosie the Riveter, uh, and it could happen. It could happen again. How can we? How can we avoid it? Uh, all I can do is keep. I can do personally is keep doing what I've been doing. You know, I I, uh, I raise my daughters in a certain way, and my and my son uh, and. Um, Tammy is raising her daughter, and her husband is here, who is here, uh, raising their daughters in a certain way. Uh, we can all we can all keep keep trying to do that and and watch for signs of backsliding. And so, in, in the interest of getting more questions from the audience, I'm not going to ask all of members of the panel to, yeah. to go through. But if anyone has a yeah, go, go ahead. <laughs> you, you get dibs if you have something provocative to say. Oh, yeah. well, we academics love to be right. We hate to be proven wrong. But your question is one of the instances where I'm really hoping that I'll be proven wrong and Mel will be right. Um, he, he is very optimistic about the end of male supremacy. It seems irreversible, unavoidable. It's gone now. And I remember back when I was when I finished a book called The Woman That Never Evolved about really how much more strategic, active, competitive, cooperative, even intermittently sexually driven, if not as continuously sexually obsessed as some men can be. Um, at the end of that book, I wrote, and I have the notes here, the female with equal rights never evolved. She was invented and fought for consciously with intelligence, stubbornness, and courage. But the advances made by feminists rest on a precarious framework built upon a unique foundation of historical conditions, new laws, values, economic opportunities, heroism on the part of women who fought for suffrage, and perhaps especially technological foundations which led to birth control and labor-saving devices. This structure is fragile. Should it collapse, it is far from certain that the scaffolding needed to surmount these barriers will ever be pieced together again. And I actually, I guess I do still worry about that. I read about ISIS. I read about the, um, you know, ideologies based on both pronatalism and violence, and those are going to be very hard for some of women's talents to overcome if they're in charge. I, um, I'm organizing some things for Planned Parenthood right now, and I'm, sh I'm from Texas originally. I'm, I would expect trouble down there, but this is in California. We're having to get special security and police protection for a Planned Parenthood event in California. It, it, you know, so I'm, yeah, I'm worried. <laughs> Anyone, do you want to comment? Grab the microphone's right there. Hello? Yeah. Oh, over the short run, in, in, in the next uh, short period of time, there's a lot of concern about the possibility of reversals, and we don't fully understand, um, if we don't fully understand why things change in the direction they did, then of course we can't predict whether or not they'll switch back. I do think there's something that's really relevant here about a general perspective on what happens in humans, which is that we're talking about change that's cultural. The, the changes, the, the improvements that we've seen are strictly based on uh, socially learned, institutionally uh, constructed things that have imp uh, changed human cultures. And we know some things about cultural evolution and how traits spread. And uh, there's something called cultural group selection where uh, apparently groups that have institutions and cultural traits that work well, those societies uh, ultimately are living better and that nearby societies are either conquered and subsumed and dominated by those cultural models or rapidly decide to copy them because they look next door and they can see the neighbors are actually living a lot better than we are. Um, there, there are some really interesting papers on why monogamy has spread uh, rampantly 
uh, in the last 500 years, just huge uh, spread of monogamy at a really rapid pace around the world. And I think we're, we, we're beginning to understand why that happened, basically because monogamous societies kick ass on societies that don't have institutional monogamy. So if this explains how things are uh, changing and why they stick, there's a, a really important observation in the long run, which is we get something called gene culture coevolution. If you construct a society that doesn't allow a lot of the expressions of sexual selection that Sarah pointed out, the big problem really is that sexual selection is there and the way it operates is it provides payoffs for traits that are kinds of traits that we wish weren't being expressed. If you construct societies for a few generations where there is no payoff, um, you know, natural selection begins to eliminate those genes. So gene culture coevolution in the long run, what I'm saying is that if you can get the, the changes that you would like to see and get them to stick for a little while, then the underlying biology changes of the entire world population, then it becomes more and more likely through time that those changes will stick permanently and forever. So um, I would be an optimist that if we can keep things changing in a particular direction for a few generations, it becomes increasingly less likely that you would ever slide back to some of the, the worst chapters in human history that Mel describes in the book. Thank you, everybody. Next question. I can't see all that well back there. I think Carlo is up. I'm Carlo Melli, I'm associate professor in the School of Life Sciences. Um, two really brief comments. Kim, your, your point actually reminds me of Baba Brinkman's song, uh, Don't Sleep With Mean People, uh, which is an attempt at cultural selection. Um, but the, the, I think, more interesting point is actually about the debate about culture and uh, gene interactions. And I think it's important to me that there's genetic variation in the ability to change by a culture. The, the, um, the malleability, if you will, excuse me. I'm, I'm thinking of things like the research on orchid versus dandelion children. Some, some genetic makeups are just sort of ignore their environment and, and plow right ahead with how they are. And some genetic makeups are very influenced by their environment and for good or ill, depending on how their environment is. And so not only is there, there's not one answer to this question of the relative importance of genes in an environment, it's there are differences in our population of how how influential each of those things are on each our phenotypes. You want to comment on that? I apologize for that not being a question. It's just a comment. So, I would uh, very, very briefly. Yeah, I would just say that I agree with you completely. And there's growing understanding of differences among children, and for example, resi natural resilience to to bad environments uh, and differences in temperament that allow some children to thrive in, in a wide range of environments and even very complex interactions between you know certain uh, certain children who uh, who are more responsive to, to both good environments and bad environments and and so as I, as I was saying to Sally about genes versus environment it gets very it gets very complicated if you if you rub your nose in it and and to 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 accurately describe what's going on is not at all easy. Who's next? No one else. Get a woman. Me. Get an elephant in the room. Mm -hmm. no. Sorry. Oh, okay. And then one over here after this one. Uh, I don't have a question, but I have a comment that I hope will uh, enrich the discussion. Uh, and I will tell you that in collaboration with. Uh, Nicole Berktold and Carl Kotlin at the University of California at Irvine, we've looked at the genome-wide gene expression in four regions of the human brain in people aged from 20 to 100, uh, both males and females. And uh, one thing I can assure you of, one of the, our most striking findings is that indeed men and women are different, uh, but uh, to look at some of this in more detail, one of the uh, very striking findings is that around age 50, men have a huge increase in expression of genes related to synaptic structure and function in the hippocampus, which is part of the brain concerned with both 
location and also with the formation of new memories, uh, women don't have this huge increase in expression of genes in that part of the brain, but around age 50, women have a huge increase in expression of genes related to the functioning of the somatic sensory cortex uh, that men don't have. And incidentally, I might add that uh, and at later ages, men and women end up in the same place in the grave. But, uh, <laughs> but a actually, uh, from, a genetic, from a point of view of gene expression, before they end up in the grave, they do end up in the same place. But around ages 50, 60, there's these huge differences in what genes are expressed in what parts of the brain. And in all honesty, we have no idea what this means. Uh, so, and I, so I think you would enjoy talking with Mel about his work on evolution in childhood. And there might be a lot to talk about there. Well, I would just say thanks for your comment. Uh, I think that studies of gene expression in, in the brain especially are, are the future of our understanding of the brain. And, and uh, um, we have a lot we have a lot to learn. I would also say that it, some people have a naive idea that as, as you get farther and farther away from, from conception and birth, <coughs> genes matter less and less. And of course, Alzheimer's disease proves that that's wrong. The only, the only disease right. where women are more vulnerable than men. Right. Other questions from the audience, please? And maybe we'll get through if we can. Um, the uh, there doesn't We're, seem we are to be, gathering data, by the way. Go ahead. Yeah, there doesn't seem to be any, any debate about uh, uh, among the panel about whether or not there are changes afoot that uh, the, the fortunes, the roles of women in society, and, and men too, are changing. Um, I think uh, central question that Dr. Hurdy's comment sort of uh, raised is this one of what exactly is causing this? In other words, how is the environment changing? What are the important as Dr. Hurdy suggested, maybe the availability of birth control technology is part of it. But I would love to hear uh, the speaker and some, maybe some subset of the panel talk about that. And that sort of goes back to this question here about the possibility of regression back to some previous state. And I think the point was made, unless we understand why these changes are occurring, we can't really know whether or not that might occur. So, again, I'd, I'd really love to hear people's thoughts on the causes of the changes that were so nicely documented. Uh, yeah, I think you, you, um, you pointed out one of the crucial ones, which is not, not just contraception, but the whole, the whole sphere of, 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 of women's control over their own reproductive futures. And uh, this, <coughs> this is the biggest change. Uh, probably that's happened to the human species in, uh, in recent centuries. Uh, I think uh, uh, monogamy is, is the rise of monogamy is an, and spread of monogamy is another one. And the, you know, the, in a way, monogamy is a, uh, a sign of growing cooperation among males and and um, and making a more cooperative. And, and less stratified and, and oppressive society. Uh, uh, so, uh, women's education, that's why I, I showed the, uh, <coughs> the slide of Malewa. The education of girls is, is the single best way by far of spending an aid dollar. And because it has ramifications for everything else positive that we want to see happen, in disadvantaged populations and uh, improves the health, the health of women, children, husbands, uh, and, and uh, but, but anyway, um, the, the, this, is, this is the most important thing I would say that's happening right, right now. Uh, so, so, you know, we're talking about culture here. <laughs> I'd like us to pretend just for a moment that we are having this conversation in Afghanistan. We actually have an expert on women in Afghanistan. I think it is not all that optimistic. Could you comment, Sally? Thanks. Afghanistan, when um, you were talking. And no, the situation there is not very optimistic. Um, I think that the polygyny is certainly something that's a factor. 
The lack of education is certainly something that's a factor. Um, they actually believe in abortion there, but they don't have much birth control. The lack of health care for women is an enormous reason that they're in such terrible shape. Forty years of war, constant war, is another reason. Um, the life expectancy for uh, all Afghans is extremely low. It's in the 40s. Um, women's is actually higher, even under those circumstances, and even given the dangers of childbirth uh, that they face and the lack of medical care. Um, the country has been declared clinically depressed by several World Health Organizations, so there's a lot of um, depression and other mental illness. And trauma, I mean, they have post-traumatic stress syndrome. Um, I've, it's, some people have estimated as much as 75% of the population. So it's a great example of how you can uh, push progress, if you talk about women's roles as progressive, backwards. Um, part of the well, Why do you think that's happening? Why do I think it's happening? Well, I can give you geopolitical explanations. Um, I think the shocking news for me is the role that the West has played in sacrificing women's rights in Afghanistan for, their, for our own political advantage. Uh, goes back to the Cold War and the relationship between, between the United States and the Soviet Union. So there was, it was well known that uh, Soviet occupation uh, brought progress for women in Afghanistan, but the U.S. did not regard it as in their interest to uh, allow that to occur under the watch of the Soviets without some retaliation. And so uh, we knowingly our governments knowingly sacrificed women's rights and educational opportunities uh, in supporting the Mujahideen, uh, the civil war that followed the, uh, the uh, retreat of the Soviets from Afghanistan, which is a, a very complicated issue. So there, even though we proclaim that we care about Afghan women, uh, we haven't shown any actual evidence of doing that. So given this traumatized population, this uh, mostly illiterate population um, that is being dominated by interpreters of Islam who don't even know what Islam might be about, um, it's, and it's, but Islam is very powerful in the, uh, in the, in the society, um, I think there's, there are abundant reasons why uh, women are not going forward in the ways that we might point to in other parts of the world. Um, but there is also tremendous courage and um, fortitude among wi the women leaders that I've been working with. And uh, if anybody is going to survive, it's going to be because of their efforts. Another thing I'll point out about the geopolitical situation is that uh, when uh, in 2001, when uh, the United States bombed Afghanistan, uh, in, and according to uh, the First Lady, in order to save women's rights and dignity, um, there, were already, there was already a 30-year tradition of women's activism on their own behalf and on behalf of social justice. The United States did not work with a single one of those organizations uh, in those early years, and still hasn't. Uh, thinking that we had the answers to, um, to their situation. So there's a lot of blame to go around. I'm glad we're not in Afghanistan. Other questions, please. Yes, um, I'd like to ask Dr. Kish, uh, what were those names of the feminists that you asked him why he didn't cite? Could you go over those again? I can, and I can even add a couple more. Um, Susan Bordeaux is uh, somebody who comes from the sciences, but has been working around in these questions for a long time about the relationship between nature and culture and you know, uh, recognizing biological elements that we need to pay attention to. I mentioned Nancy Tuana, I think I did, 
uh, who's a philosopher, who's also working in this, uh, this realm that I was talking about, about reconceptualizing human nature relationships uh, and integration. Um, Donna Haraway, um, I mentioned. Who else did I mention? Uh, um, Elizabeth. Elizabeth uh, uh, Gross, G-R-O-Z, uh, is another person. I think it's particularly... Uh, well, why don't we put the list up on our webpage? So okay. Can, yeah, can and there are many, many others um, that I uh, will will post. Randy, okay, could and I, then I uh, have just one question for the panel: What significance do you give, if any, that all the questions before mine were asked by men? So, so I was I was going to also call attention really to the elephant in the room. I'm really surprised that no one has actually brought up the question about what the implications are for acknowledging there are evolved differences in male-female psychology for our policies about affirmative action and getting women to have equal representation in all professions. And many people that I've talked with back in Michigan fight the whole idea because they think that if women and men have what they call biological differences, this implies that attempts to get equal representation for women in all professions and equal proportions of questions from audiences from women and women are misguided. What do people think about that? I'm thank thankful that you asked the question. I've been waiting for, for that to happen since the beginning of the question period. I mentioned the the moderator when I, when I twice said, that we need to make sure study, we get a question from We haven't from keeping a, track. And, 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 uh, and I hope the next question will also come from a woman. But why is that, Mel? Why do I hope that? Yes. Well, first of all, it's been very unequal so far, as, uh, as this lady pointed out, and uh, I don't like inequality. I was going to chime in with a little bit of hope about understanding sex differences, which is that every time I get in a taxi to go to an airport to a conference, when someone asks me what I do, I say that I study evolution, which might first be sticking my foot in my mouth, and then I tell them that I study sex differences, which is sticking my other foot in my mouth, and somehow I'm still able to talk. And <laughs> I get a lot of very interesting questions, and the last time that sticks out very prominently in my mind is, so I study genetic sex differences um, between genetic males and genetic females, which I would argue my definition of gender is an identity of oneself and not sexual orientation. I just want to throw that out there because it seems to be getting confused a little. And it gets confused a lot when I talk to people. And, and, and the last person who, who was kind enough to drive me to the airport, he said, so could you really tell me what's the genetic basis of homosexuality? And I want to know, because my cousin is gay, and if I can tell everyone in my family that it's not his choice, then they'll accept it. Because it's not, he's not trying to be contrarian, it's just, this is not something that he has control over. And so I think, on one hand, studying sex differences, studying genetic and biological basis of sexual orientation and of gender can provide There's so many words, ammunition, closure, justification, acceptance. Maybe acceptance is the best. That there are differences and it doesn't mean that one is superior to another, but it means that we can understand that they're there and we're not, in a way, I choose to be contrarian, but that's myself. Um, but it, it provides information that can help people understand each other. A lot of gay and bisexual people have found it liberating when biologists were able to say decisively uh, this sexual orientation is not a choice. Uh, there are choices about how you behave in prison and stuff like that, but basic sexual orientation is, is not a choice, and people, people who were confused about that uh, had their lives improved by, by knowing that, that fact. And, and that they, you know, that's because certain scientists went against the, the tide of, of our cultural atmosphere 
in the mid 20th century and, and actually found that out. We have time for just a couple more questions. Hi, I'm a woman. <laughs> <laughs> I have a seemingly simple question for the panel, uh, which is, if there are so many positive consequences that come from the trend that you're discussing, why, for men as well as women, why does it feel like such a fight to get where we're trying to go? Why, why does Sarah need protection to fight for female reproductive rights? If people don't, no, nobody who has power relinquishes power very willingly. Uh, in, in, in a way, it's, it's rather amazing. When you, when you think about the history of the late 19th and early 20th century, all male legislatures around the world and in every state had a vote, all male legislatures had a vote for women to get the vote. One after another, after another, after another. It's kind of amazing to me, looking back, that that, that ever happened. And it happened because women struggled so hard to make men see the light on 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 this subject. But it's it's not impossible in spite of they the fact that... They weren't supposed to be here until 715. Sorry, what? I'd like to try to talk to that, too. Um, it's true that women's fighting for things uh, is, the, is what we've, it's, that's the history. None of these changes have come easily and, and it does make us ask ourselves, what is this, uh, what is this antagonism? Power has a lot to do with it. By the way, women, it took 50 years, of course, for women to get the vote. And in the end, it came down to the vote of one member of Congress whose mother, uh, told him the night before, you better do the right thing. Uh, <laughs> and he did. But it was not ever easy to get these. And power sharing is certainly a lot of it. Privilege is very hard to give up. So anybody who's in a privileged situation feels entitled often. And it's uh, difficult to get it to be shared. But um, it leads me to a question that uh, I didn't talk about earlier, but made me wonder, um, a kind of corollary to what you're asking, is if, if women do have these genetic forms of superiority that you've talked about, um, why hasn't that translated into social power? Because in other species that you discuss, it seems like the, the um, genetic fitness uh, goes along with certain kinds of social roles um, that are powerful. And I wondered if the answer is, I mean, it just leads me back to my other question, which is, um, is really what characterizes our species more about the way that we can create variants on these genetic uh, pro propensities or proclivities um, rather than the way they drive our behavior. Does that make sense? Yeah, sure. I, I mean, one of, one of the most rapid changes in, in behavior, in social behavior, in the evolutionary record is the one divergence between uh, chimpanzees and bonobos. And that only took about one and a half million years. Really, that's really fast. Oh, we don't want to wait one and a half million years. We don't even want to wait one and a half centuries. Although anthropologists take the long view. So I said 50 years from, from Elizabeth Cady Stanton's speech to, to women getting the vote. 50, 50 years uh, from, from that to second wave feminism. And 50 years from second wave feminism until now, we're seeing, I think, a, a, a tipping point toward, toward a better Future. I, I had two grandmothers who couldn't vote until they were 40 years old. I have a granddaughter who was born on June 27th. I was invited, uh, and it was great. She is going to have a life and a set of opportunities that my two grandmothers would not even be able to imagine in their wildest 
dream. To me, you know, I know I, I, I know you, I know people are impatient. Women are impatient. Have a right to be impatient. That's why the world changes because people are impatient. Keep on being impatient. Keep working for for greater equality and greater opportunities for women and 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 for our daughters and. Uh, as long as we keep doing that, it will keep happening. That's my view. So I think we're going to take one more question and then ask for the panel for their last wrap-up provocative comment. I have a question up here. Oh, I mean, we might have to have two. Okay. But it was Hi. Um, I'm Emily. I'm a women and gender studies major here. And um, I, I thought it was really interesting um, when you talked about the more women that are getting more involved in politics. And my question was just for Mel. Um, I was wondering if you thought that um, if Hillary Clinton did become president, if you thought she would make a lot of strides for women um, and how you thought that having a woman president would affect the world and like women's rights globally. So um, remember, maybe it was Sarah who pointed out uh, that Margaret Thatcher did nothing. Oh no, it was you. It was Sally. It was not Margaret Thatcher. Not only did nothing for women, she probably did less than nothing. Uh, Angela Merkel was not exactly a beacon of, of change for 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 women. That you know, and I argue with my. I'm a, I'm a liberal. I argue, but I argue with my liberal friends about this uh, a lot. I want to see women in power. Uh, I'd rather see somebody like Hillary Clinton than somebody like Margaret Thatcher. But what, what, when Margaret Thatcher was, was Prime Minister of Britain and, and when Angela Merkel was Chancellor of Germany, every little girl in those countries is looking at those women on TV and saying, oh, I could do that. And that never happened before in either of those countries. It's, it's important for the future even if those those particular women leaders are not doing the right thing. Just uh, in the unlikely position of defending Margaret Thatcher, uh, I, uh, <laughs> uh, Margaret Thatcher had so little female solidarity. There was no critical mass of right. women in Congress to support her. She had no avenue to where she got except to behave like a man, only more so. So I'm not sure. Uh, and she did get there on her own, as opposed to many of the previous women leaders, Indira Gandhi, for example, whose father had been Nehru. And so, so I mean, that's impressive. Queen she Elizabeth showed what we could do. She didn't show what women could do when women were coming into power on their own terms. <laughs> well, oh, so thinking we'll, about that, we have an example right now. We have an African-American president, and yet Black Lives Matter is a hashtag, and unarmed black men are being shot routinely in the United States. More than 500 people have been shot by police in the U.S., and most of them are African-American men. So... While I think it would be wonderful to have a president with ideas that I agree with, and I'm not sure if that's Hillary or not, um, I don't think that the gender of our president or the ethnicity or race of our president is going to make tremendous differences in our society. Yeah, let's not forget the word backlash, uh, which, you know, the, it, it isn't a steady uh, stream upward. There's always ins and outs and responses and reversals of trends um, that happen. And even if you have a strong model, as you're just saying, uh, it, can, it can bring out uh, the crazies uh, who are so resentful of that kind of power holding uh, that it can end up being counterproductive and dangerous. So I think it's never a simple matter of we model something and then it happens. I think we make certain kinds of progress and then we have to deal with the fact that there's a reduction of that progress because there's resentment of it and that 
this is maybe become even more prevalent in our society as um, we've become more atomized, more uh, living in our own little groups and not trying very hard to understand other groups. And our last question, please. Hi. Um, I have a feminist STS background, which is some of the authors that Sally was mentioning. And so while listening to this conversation, I was really struck by the discussion about whether these changes are genetics or whether they're science, you know, um, objectively scientific or whether they're cultural. And a lot of the, the language is, um, so, so my question is about this divide. And a lot of the feminist SDS perspectives about science has been that science has this kind of legitimating language, this idea of objectivity. Um, so, it, so if you can say women are genetically different, kind of, kind of the argument that you were saying, then people can feel like that legitimizes certain claims. And so I was wondering about um, whether you see your approach um, in either of these veins or or speaking to that idea that by talking about difference, um, whether it's sexual or gender difference, can argue about that, is um, whether your book contributes to that language of objectivity. I hope so. I, I, uh, I don't see how any of us as a species, as a country, as a community, can advance with false ideas. And, um, and so knowing back some of the facts about this issue better than some, some people do, I wanted to, to, to create a framework in which the truth, fact, the facts about, about gender as I understand them and as, as most, I would say most scientists understand them today, um, would not be used as a weapon against women anymore. It would not be used as, uh, as, as a way to keep women down, the way it, biology has been used so much throughout history. And I, I get that uh, a, lot of, a lot of women are, 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 are not uh, eager to hear this message that I have in my book um, because they know that history. And I get that, and I don't blame them for being wary that, that this whole conversation can get us on a slippery slope back to where we use biology and genes as, and hormones as a weapon against women once again. But I think that the, 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 the facts are that, that, um, that it can be used as a weapon in, in favor of, of women in favor of women's equality, in favor of girls' education, in favor of, of, of more, uh, more collaboration between, uh, between men and, and, and women. In fact, I don't, I don't see any other way to interpret the fact uh, that, uh, uh, that, I see, that I understand. So it's a very good question, and, and I don't blame anyone who is wary of this kind of conversation. Um, given the history, but I think going forward we can, we can accept the, the facts as science sees them and not allow them to be used against women, but actually encourage people to use, to, to, to use them in favor of women. So that could be the beginning of a very long further conversation. I'd like to let anyone urgently say one more thing. All right, our time is up. Thank you so much to Mel. Thank you. And to all thank you all. Time.